the mindset shift that people have to make is the money is subservient to them. They're not subservient to the money. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today it is my privilege to converse with Mr. Richie Clapson, the co-founder of Property CEO. So Richard has had a very interesting career spanning nearly four decades in property development. Mr. Clapson has firmly established himself within the industry. Uh, he is the founder of Property CEO, where he imparts his vast knowledge guiding both budding and seasoned property developers to achieve significant returns from small to medium scale projects. Richie's commendable portfolio is a testament to his expertise. Originally, he was trained as a structural engineer, and he has lent his skills to an array of new builds, commercial ventures, and industrial conversions. Moreover, Throughout his distinguished career, he has taken many developers and property experts under his wing, offering them invaluable mentorship. Beyond property development, he's carved out a reputation as a business coach and strategist. Under his leadership, one of the UK's foremost structural engineering firms flourished. Furthermore, he earned the prestigious appointment by the government to serve as a peer review engineer for the London 2012 Olympic Stadium. So... This was a fantastic uh, episode. I got some brilliant insights here into wealth creation, the difference between earning money and making money. Um, it's very clear Richie has got an, an extraordinary amount of expertise, understanding both from a professional working in the construction industry uh, and as an entrepreneur dealing and working with um, um, development and self-initiated projects. Again, a very hot topic right now for architects, particularly here at Business of Architecture, as we're leading a campaign and a mission for the affluent architect, for architects to be able to build wealth, becoming a developer, becoming a property CEO is one of those skills, is one of those opportunities that is available to us all. And people like Richie can be a great facilitator of that expertise. So, Sit back, relax, and enjoy Richie Clapson. And now a message from today's sponsor, RCAT. As design and architecture demand increases towards pre-pandemic levels and beyond, how are you and your firm keeping up? Well, RCAT's here to help. RCAT.com offers several free tools to help architecture and design firms like yours get work done faster. Use RCAT's powerful search engine to find the right products for your projects and download BIM, CAD, and specifications right there on the same page without having to pay or register. RCAT.com also offers product videos, catalogs, green reports, product certification information, outline and short form specification generation, and more. RCAT.com is your one-stop solution to help increase your productivity and get more projects done. That's RCAT.com, A-R-C-A-T.com. Richie, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very good, uh, Ryan. Thanks for asking me. I'm very pleased to be here. My pleasure. So a very interesting career. You're not an architect, so I always enjoy speaking with people who are kind of uh, outside of the, the architecture industry. You're a director at Property CEO, um, uh, which is a, a training agency, if you like, or a training consulting firm where you're helping people make money from small scale property development. Your your own background was as a as an engineer, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, I'm a chartered structural engineer by profession. There you go. So so you you very similar kind of um profession to to architecture and now you're spending a lot of your time teaching landlords, property developers, um professionals, investors how to actually take on small scale developments and turn them into businesses, which is, you know, actually last night I was here in New York, we led an event called the Architect Developer, where we had a, a kind of round table discussion, which was filled with architects. We had one architect who had, they'd done some very simple renovations to their own home, or actually mm -hmm. quite complex renovations to someone who just finished their first development project, someone who had done oh. five, to one architect who literally their whole business model is architect developer and they've rebuilt large swathes of Dumbo Brooklyn so kind of a real spectrum of scale Ooh. from small residential to multi housing multi-million dollar um, uh, um, schemes so Sounds like something a fantastic evening it was it was very interesting very very Ooh. interesting um, and 
this is a topic which I think you know so many architects are interested in doing because, and and I would imagine a lot of other property professionals or construction professionals because you're working so closely with these financial assets, you're inputting a whole load of your own expertise, and yet the upside for you as a service professional is not always comparable with, say, the person who's taking the most risk financially, um, which would be the developer. And that's often, for certainly for architects, that's often a kind of a source of either frustration or inspiration, <laughs> depending. <laughs> Well, well, I guess I guess the frustration you need to turn into inspiration because there's no point sitting there with frustration unless you're going to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So perhaps you can start by telling us a little bit about your own career trajectory. What took you from engineering to um, what you're doing now? Yeah, well, yeah, that, it's interesting. I mean, I, I followed the professional route, uh, right? And so I left. Uh, I left school at 16 here in the UK. And, you know, I come from a, a, a good background, but we weren't a wealthy family. So, um, you know, you had to make your own way. And my father was a, a, a structural engineer, well, still is a structural engineer, doesn't practice anymore. And he uh, was a fellow of the Institute of Structural Engineers. So he got to a fairly high level, very technical individual, very capable, very clever man. And I suppose naturally you, you, you think about following your father. And he, bought, he used to bring accountancy books home and, and tell me to read them. And I, I read them and I, I, I couldn't be bothered with that. So I left school at 16 and I started on the drawing board. And I, and I did my educational day release, my university degree day release, and became a charter structural engineer in my uh, mid-20s. But very quickly, uh, I realized that actually the engineering wasn't really getting me out of bed. That wasn't the exciting thing. I... I joined a large corporate, long story short, I went through a couple of businesses, joined a large corporate who was very acquisitive. And it's a company uh, called WSP, uh, used to be called William Sale Partnership back in the day. And I was there the very early days. I mean, they're a global business now. And um, I learned a lot there about acquisition and growth of business. And in 1998, I decided to leave and, and start my own business. Mm -hmm. And I bought uh, a practicing structural engineering company in, uh, in West London and uh, went out and acquired a number of other businesses along the way and built uh, build ourselves up for a sale. So we, we always had a plan to build that business for sale. It was a 10-year plan, and we, we, we did it in 10 years. A lot of people say, how can you have a 10-year plan? Well, you, of course you have a plan. The, 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 the route changes, but if you said 10 years, you've got to work 10 years. I missed it by four days, so I was always a bit, a bit furious about that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we, we grew that business and and for me, yeah, I'm I am a structural engineer. I'm a chartered structural engineer, so I'm professionally qualified. But I'm a businessman, and mm -hmm. what I did is I worked out how to how to get that business scaled at the right level, and get a multiplier into that business to sell it at a high level, a seven figure sum. And we positioned ourselves. I, I basically became probably one of the best structural engineering firms in the country, mm -hmm. if if not partly in the world. Not me personally, but I had some real top performers that I engaged into the business. And we positioned ourselves, so we were invited by the government to peer review the 2012 Olympic Stadium, National Aquatics, and the Velodrome. So we worked at that very high level. So you sort of people say, well, you're the best in the world. Well, the best engineers in the world design those buildings. And, well, they had to find someone better to check those engineers. And that was us. And so that positioned us for a sale. And uh, 2008, we executed the sale in 2010, finished the year now, and left and retired. So that's my structural engineering journey, well, if, well that, if you like. I mean, that in itself is incredibly impressive because, A, it's very unusual to hear people even think, like you said, to have a 10-year plan and to be thinking about an exit and an exit being like an equity event or a sale in in the world of engineering or architecture. And that, that, that takes quite a leap. I mean, in lots of other businesses and industries, that's quite standard standard thinking but mm. in, in construction that's not often that's an innovation if you like i think it is yeah I, you know I, I i am an innovator you know I, I i like to push the boundaries i like to do things and and you said it ryan you said at the beginning of this uh, this podcast you said there's a lot of architects who, who who often look at the rewards they get for their architecture and the same as us as structural engineers yeah. compared to what the developer got well i looked at very quickly worked out what i was earning as a as, as an owner owner director of uh, a fairly reasonable size uh, but well performing structural engineering firm and then i worked out what i would earn if i sold the business 
and it was it paled into insignificance. So why wouldn't you build a business for sale? You know, you, you, you're many, many more times in terms of money back out the back end, and it's all profit. And there's a, there's a great saying someone said to me once, if you can bank some money, bank some money, because you can go again. So I retired in my, in my early 40s. And during that time, although I was a structural engineer, and I, I did sort of high-level engineering, I didn't really crunch the numbers. I didn't run the projects. I had a team to do that. And I worked with developers. So for many years, I've worked with existing developers and worked with them to do things better. I'm a bit of an out of the box thinker. I'm a little bit to the point sometimes. You know, I have a short attention span and I don't see why we can't do something. I like to knock heads, heads together and say, come on, let's just, surely we can find a solution. It doesn't matter what we've always done. Let's find a solution. And so I used to work with developers and help them develop and be better developers and, and work with other people that wanted to become developers. And that gave me an appetite for working with developers. And, you know, did a few of my own developments along the way, uh, you know, on that journey. And as I say, retired in 2010. So that was my engineering journey over and done with in my early 40s. Fantastic. And then, and then what happened? So I know you're going to ask that. <laughs> you're going to go, well, so what happened then? How did you get to where you got to? Well, I think the journey is interesting because um, uh, we, I suppose we all, a lot of us have this, uh, ambition to retire uh, and uh, and I now know probably that's probably not the right thing and I think I'm a believer now in uh, work and retirement or retirement and work if if you can actually tie them together mm -hmm. they're the same thing and I, I said to someone the other evening uh, just after a presentation I'd done on stage in London and I said well, they said what do you mean by that because I talked about that comment and I said well think about the uh, you know, your, 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 your pop stars your, your musicians or your great actors, do they, do they retire at 65 and buy a camper van and travel the world? No, they don't. Or an RV, if you're in the States, they don't. You know, so so they, they, they just get that balance right. And their work is, is their retirement. Their retirement is their work. And, and I think, I think uh, well, I know in, in 2010, I got that wrong. So uh, I, I, bought, I bought a boat. I bought some cars. I bought quite a few cars. I bought a big house, big pool, big cinema room in the basement. And I thought we'd, we'd, we'd done it all. And then I dabbled with some businesses. But I had no real purpose or focus or vision on what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, that's the thing that we often can get to. And a lot of entrepreneurs that sell out interesting enough i was talking to a great entrepreneur in this country here in the uk who said they're a bit like lottery winners lottery winners have no purpose and they normally blow their money within two or three years yeah a lot of entrepreneurs who sell out can lose everything within a few years and thankfully i didn't but uh, mm -hmm. but I, I definitely made some mistakes you know one that cost me half a million pound uh which the kids weren't happy there's part of their inheritance gone so they were all over that one but you know it, it it, things happen and then you think well what do i want to do what did you do to what, lose a half million quid what did i do uh, i let someone else what? run a business okay i i set up a construction company with a friend of mine number one rule don't work with your friends mm -hmm. uh, but we did and you know it went quite well it was a bit of fun let him run it and my fault took my eye off the ball let him run it and and he messed it up and so i had to step back in and I mean, he did a runner. He basically just right. disappeared. Uh, you know. So there we go. No, no backbone of that fella. But anyway, such is life. You learn. And I had to step back in. And and I remember actually, it was interesting because this this makes you stronger. All these things make you stronger. And, and Ryan, my my accountant said to me, he said, "Oh, you're okay. You don't have too many personal guarantees on this." I, I said, "No, but we owe people money." He said, "Yeah, yeah, but you don't have personal guarantees." Mm -hmm. I said, no, but we owe people money, so uh, I need to pay them. And so we had lots of unfinished projects, uh, deposits paid by clients, their work hasn't been started, uh, lots of trade contractors. I remember, and coincidentally, I was chatting about this last night, too. I, I met at an event a couple of tradespeople, plumbers in the UK, and I was telling this story, and I said, well, there were two electricians who were owed £15,000, mm -hmm. uh, and they had no personal guarantees, but that was the difference of them paying their mortgage or not. Yeah, so I absolutely. paid them. Of course I paid them. And so, so the half a million was me paying everyone off, finishing all the, uh, the obligations of the business and, and moving on. So, um, right. yeah, it was an interesting year, 2016. Um, when you see half a million quid just going out of your bank account month after month, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting journey. But getting, g pulling all that to one side, what I, 
what I decided to do was actually, I guess, let me tell you the story. I, I wanted to find out what I wanted to do in life. And, and I think when you get to a point when you can pretty much do what you want. So we, 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 we got rid of that construction company. Eventually, I, I had to liquidate one, start a new one, finish the obligations and sold it off. Okay. And I had a period in 2016 where I had absolutely nothing to do again. And so mm -hmm. I thought, what, what, what should I do? And uh, a friend of mine said, um, come on these, I got a couple of tickets to an event in London the weekend. And it was all about fix your mind, find your true purpose in life. And I thought, I thought, Ryan, I thought that'd be fascinating. So I, I went along and I, and I played, you know, I played the game with them. Uh, I thought you're going to go all in. If you're going to go to something, you've got to go all in. And it was a bit odd. Some of the things were a bit, what I call woo woo for me, but sure. we were working with our unconscious minds. Okay. And, and we had to do this exercise and a long story short, because I could talk for, talk for an hour about this, it accumulated with turning the last page of this process, picking up a pen, using your unconscious mind and writing your true purpose in life. And I did it. And I wrote this statement. And I looked at it. And then the, uh, the guy who was running the event, David, this guy called David Shepard in the UK, he came over and he said, hey, getting on. I said, I've done. I said, I've written this. He went, that's really good. I said, yeah, but what do you think about it? How did that happen? He said, did you do everything I said? I said, yes, I did. He said, that's fine then. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I've got all these business interests. So I had other stuff going on, including developments. And he said, um, he said, well, which one of those businesses relate to, to, to your purpose in life? And it was property CEO, which is what I now run. And he said, well, just do, just do what, what your purpose is. Do that for the rest of your life, and you'll be the richest you could ever imagine. And he walked away. And he turned back. And he said, but I don't mean financially. And my statement <laughs> that I wrote, my statement that I wrote back in 2017, January 2017, was inspirational, thought-provoking leader with the energy and drive to enthuse others. Hmm. And that's what I do. And, and so we decided to set up Property CO, formalize what I was doing. Ian, my business partner, was a student of mine. And this coincided with the end of a year's private training. So I used to train people privately. He said to me, we should start a property training company now. Uh, there are a few property training companies in the UK who have a bit of a bad rap. I don't know whether that's fair or unfair, uh, but I wasn't really interested in starting another company. But mm -hmm. um, long story short, he persuaded me. Uh, best decision I've ever made. And really all I do now is, uh, you know, I, I'm the sort of, I guess, front man in lots of ways for the business. I'm the property guy. I've been in this industry over 40 years. I'm professionally qualified. I've done this loads and loads of years. And so now, I go around the country speaking to hundreds, if not thousands of people every year, uh, and and I train students. I train students, uh, both brand new people to become property developers and existing people, uh, existing developers to do it better. And it fits around two visions. Mm -hmm. I have two visions, and this is why I do what I do. Um, not only is that purpose, that statement in life, always behind me, inspirational, thought-provoking leader with the energy and drive to enthuse others, but two visions, one vision. Uh, to help do my bit to solve the housing crisis in the UK, because we fall hundreds of thousands, 700,000 short every year. And if I can train small scale property developers that used to deliver 30% of the housing in this country, but now deliver less than 12, I can do my bit there. And we desperately need houses in the UK. And second part of the vision is to help those people. And as you rightly say, Ryan, it does include a lot of industry professionals, whether that be architects, structural engineers, project managers, cost consultants, as well as other business people out there in completely unrelated industries. If they want to earn 100, 200, 300,000 a year, 400, doing property development, small scale property development, you know, smaller projects between five and 20 units. And if they're prepared to put the hard work in, I'd love to help them, support them with my team and my processes and change their life. And that's exciting, changing people's lives mm -hmm. when they're prepared to put the work in and you get them to, because 200, 300,000 a year does make any difference to the big UK house builders, whether that be Barrett's or Persimmon or Bellway. But two to 300,000 a year by converting maybe an old industrial building or an office block into some flats changes the life of an individual. Yeah, That's absolutely. what I do now and why I do it. Absolutely. Um, amazing, very, very inspiring kind of, uh, two wings there of your of your vision the first part let's talk about the housing crisis and the very i mean this is again and, and i like the fact this is something that's very much on the 
uh, a priority for so many architects and why becoming a developer actually is very empowering because you can have a direct impact on actually creating housing and actually in architects I do believe have a very good eye for actually identifying sites or identifying plots which most developers would would walk away from and they're able to actually see something unusual or unlock it in a very innovative way um mm -hmm. i mean yesterday's uh, talk here in new york was filled of kind of urban gap sites of architects taking them ones that developers have overlooked and doing something very interesting and and unleashing a lot of equity inside of that with the with the developers very interesting as well that, that you're actually helping not just professionals get into development but existing small-scale developers to be able to increase their their volume if you like how do you do, yeah. how do you do this what, what what kind of process do you take people through when they first kind of start consulting with you okay yeah so so i'll tell you what we did let me just take you back in terms of i used to train people privately and that's right. how i met my business partner so i trained him for a year and i used to take either individuals or a small group on a 12-month journey and go through a process with them that was fairly fairly prescriptive but it wasn't entirely laid out i guess because i used to do it myself i knew what i was doing mm -hmm. the fundamental principle to this to set the scene for this is i train you to run a property development company and let me let me wind the clock back to to when i first met <clears throat> ian who's the co-founder of property ceo here he met me i came off stage at an event and he came up to me and his background is uh, global corporate finance um, business underwriting and so on. Anyway, he'd, he'd retired out of that. And he, he s seeked me out. Someone had recommended me. He'd come to see me. I came off stage. He'd come over and said, I've come here to see you tonight. Great talk. Boom, 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 boom. I'd like you to train me to be a property developer. I said, okay, well, that's good. And he said, I have some questions. And amongst his questions, he said, my number one question is, how can you get me credibility to be a property developer? How can you get my credibility up? I said, just remind me what, what it is you've done again. So he told me global corporate finance. And I said, no, I can't do that then. He said, what do you mean? I said, I can't get you credibility as, as a property developer. He said, well, that's what I want. I said, I don't care what you want. <laughs> I, I, I said, uh, you know, if I came into your industry, am I going to get credibility straight away? Well, no, I'm not. You know, and if I wanted to be a doctor or a dentist, I've got to learn a long time. What if I want to be a structural engineer? Nine years it took me to get qualified, you know, with all the training and the on-the-job stuff. Oh, and I, I said, but what I can do, I can get you credibility as a property CEO, chief executive officer. What's that, he said? What does that mean? And I said, well, look, let's take this cabinet minister analogy. We have a, uh, in the UK, government ministers, and we have a uh, minister in charge of defence. Do you think for one minute that minister knows anything about tanks and guns and army? Probably not. And next month they might go to uh, 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 health. Let's say health. Do they, do they suddenly have all of the experience of doctors and medicines and hospitals? Well, no, they don't. And being completely apolitical, not going, well, of course they'd bloom and dope. Forget <laughs> any politics. Yeah. What they do is they use their skills as a ministerial leader, a department leader, a CEO, if you like of those businesses, a la Richard Branson. Richard Branson is not an expert on aeroplanes, cruise ships, finance, or probably anything else he does, but he's a CEO. And that's the number one fundamental principle because it's about leverage. So overarching everything, all I teach people, Brian, is to run a business. And most people in, in the UK and probably around the world don't get trained how to run a business. And it just happens to be a property development business. And I take them on a 12 month journey which revolves around uh, open university style education. So they have about 100 modules. And this is serious educational stuff. It's, um, you know, these bespoke modules took us a year, one year to record all of these modules, write it all down, take everything out of my head, put it together, edit it, get it ready to, uh, to bring people in. So they get 100 modules. They do eight weeks of education. And then we have a full industry coaching team. I'm talking about structural engineers architects, project managers, cost consultants, you know, planning consultants that help guide them along that way, business coaches, performance coaches, branding coaches. And they have all these interactions as well as a lot of interactions with myself and, and Ian. And they do those eight weeks of education. Then they come to the room 
and they come to the room, they spend in, so education, I think as an adult, you have to learn online because you, you can't learn in a classroom as an adult mm -hmm. because you go at the average speed of the person in the classroom. And as we develop into adults, I, I mean, I, I, I would be bored in a classroom because my attention span is very short. And so, uh, you know, I want to learn faster, faster, faster. Whereas if you're a bit slow, you're going to fall behind. So we, that's why we have the online. So when you come in the room, we do primarily what I would call live deal reviews, live deal analysis, up on a big screen, looking at projects, looking at opportunities. Like you were saying there in New York, these gap sites, what can we do with them? How can we create them? And we play around with those in, in, in a, we have what we call Academy Days and Developers Club. Developers Club has all the industry professionals there. And we play around with it and we cement the theoretical education into a practical education and training process in the room and effectively after the end of 12 months we 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 teach people we have a process it's like any good business there's there's a process and there's a system around it we call it eight pillars i'm a great believer that every business has eight pillars around it you know any business i used to advise on business structure and businesses for sale mm -hmm. and you know you can look at hr finance marketing sales and you can build up eight pillars we have a process of eight pillars, a system and a process that we take people through. And at the end of it, we've taught you how to build a team and go and run a property development business. So you don't have to be a structural engineer. You're never going to be an architect. You, it's impossible for you to be a planning consultant. You know, and you're not going to lay the bricks. People, it's bizarre. I say to people, do you fancy laying the brickwork? Oh, no, I wouldn't be doing that. What about wiring it up? No way. Good God, man, I wouldn't be doing that. So why do you want to be the project manager or the architect? Mm -hmm. You don't. You actually just engage with a team. Al, our cabinet minister, and Richard Branson as a CEO. That's the approach. That's the theory that we add on the practical side, all framed around Ryan being the CEO of a property company. Does that right. answer your question? Yeah. So, so that's so actually what you're doing is you're giving people a, a kind of new way of looking at their own business. So, if you're working with a developer, you're kind of getting them to. I'm, I'm assuming here to kind of get more out of the weeds and be more in a strategic position. Yeah, uh, and understanding the, the mechanics of the business, and then when you're Very working, much. and when you're working with um, other professionals who are entering into development, then again, it's a, it's from the perspective of them becoming the CEO as opposed to actually being too in the weeds. Is that right? Yeah, it, it is. And of course, there's a lot though. You see, there's so many existing developers, and I know many in this country who've never had the the opportunity to be educated mm -hmm. because there isn't really any sort of for, there are some university degrees and stuff you can do in estate management and real estate and so on but they're not really training you to be a developer so there's no real formal education i guess what we do is about as close as you can get to that with our open university style sort of education but um I think there's a lot of existing developers who, who've just learned their business and their craft in a school of hard knocks, often ex tradespeople that's, that's got grown up, and some of them very successful. But when you start introducing to them processes of leverage, because there's a lot of developers who don't have time. Mm -hmm. uh, they have lots of money, but no time. And, and, and you know, money's no good without time because time's more important than money. And so if you, 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 those people we sometimes work with, how you leverage it, how you don't run your own projects. You know, I have a great, great saying. I love it. It's don't buy a dog and bark yourself. You know, you just you get someone to do the job for you. There's a great book um, uh, that, that actually out at the moment. I'm going uh, to steal that I think one. Daniel, I like you that. like that one. Don't buy a dog and bark yourself. You can use that. That's free from me. <laughs> but there's a great book, Dan Sullivan. And, oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Oh, uh, yeah. You probably oh, yeah. Know Dan. I know. I know. I saw Benjamin Hardy uh, speak the other week, actually. Ah, well, they've got a great book. It's called Who, Not How. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Worth a read. It was recommended at a presentation I was doing as, as a book of the month. And it really, it sort, of, it sort of dovetails in with everything I say, because the who, not how principle is, is if we think about development, you don't go, well, how can I build the brickwork? No, no, you want who's going to build the brickwork. You don't go, how can I learn to be a planning consultant? No, you go, no, go, who can do the planning consultancy? And you don't think, well, how am I going to how am I going to run the team? Well, you don't. Who's going to run the team? Mm. You know, you're going to run the business. And the who, not how philosophy is so so powerful uh, that that I think it, you know it sort of opens up this this objective, what to do. And I think that's where existing developers fall foul. And there's lots of technicalities and stuff they don't know. They often don't know formally about contracts, JCT contracts, which is a joint contracts tribunal, which is a, a process of contracts we have in the UK, which a lot of the UK people will be familiar with. And, it, and so it's opened their eyes to that, to leverage the business structure, 
how you actually structure the business properly. But I think the leverage is the biggest thing that probably people don't understand, which is a fundamental part of it for those existing developers. So when you're working with, uh, say, engineers or architects who are becoming developers, um, how do you stop them from kind of getting too involved in the projects? Because I can imagine, and, you know, architects, they love to try and do everything themselves. And this is exactly what you're, what you're kind of training people to, to do is to exercise leverage and be thinking about building out teams and, um, and, and processes. For an architect, they might be kind of looking, that's one of the reasons why they want to do the project is because they want to have kind of creative control um, and to be the one that's, that you know this is it's freedom both financially intellectually and creatively so is there is there a conflict in that or is that still very possible inside of a, a kind of highly leveraged model I, I think it is okay and and i think um an architect as you say a lot of architects have the passion for that design mm -hmm. but the money the, there's two things you can do in life you can earn money and you can make money mm -hmm. And so you can exchange your time for money or you can make money. And making money uh, uh, is generally more preferable. Mm -hmm. And if we look at a, 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 a typical small-scale development project in the UK uh, yielding, let's just pick some numbers, okay? Let's pick 300,000 profit. You're going to make 300,000 pounds. Let's be very generous because they won't get this much, but let's assume the architect got paid 30,000 pounds fee, architectural fee, 30,000 pounds to do that project, okay? Now, the question I often ask people, and it applies to an architect, project manager, structural engineer, project managers uh, typically it applies to as well. So a lot of project managers go, I'm going to run my own projects. No one runs a project as well as me. No, but there's the whole 80-20 rule. Do they run 80% as good as you? And that's good enough. Mm -hmm. So the question I then say, so let's say the project manager, and it relates to say back to the architecture, but it's like, I, I, I think there's a twist with an architecture or with architects. So if, if I said to a project manager, and I often do this because they're the common ones, and I say, okay, how much is your project management fee? Let's say 30,000 pounds. I say, okay, 30,000 pounds. Great stuff. And I really want to run it. Okay, that's great. And then I just go off track completely. I say, hey, tell you what, here's a question. What if I gave you 10 million pound? Okay, you've got 10 million pound right now. What would you do? What would you do over the next five or 10 years? They go, oh, I don't, yeah, do you know? Oh, I don't think about that. What would I do? Oh, well, I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love to do this. Okay. And it might be, I don't know, motor racing. It, I, I'd love to, I'd love to travel the world. Uh, you know, my wife and I, I'd love to, uh, to really get my kids into, into this or that. I want to learn to fly. Um, oh, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to learn to play the guitar. I've always, and they do all the, they, 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 they rattle off. When you get them into that, that frame of, no, generally think about it, 10 million pound in your bank, visualize it. And they rattle off all these things. And I said, to you, that's interesting, isn't it? Not once did you say, and what I wouldn't mind doing is a bit of project management on the side. <laughs> they don't. Okay. And so I go, that's not your passion. And you might have relayed to me before it was your passion. Oh, yeah. Oh, perhaps it's not. And, and then I say, so at the end of the day as well, that £30,000 has to be earned. So there's your hourly rate. Whatever way you cut and carve it, you are earning an hourly rate. How many hours have you got to put in a project manager project? Quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of hassle. And you're on sort of, your, you know, your 24-7 call, the contractor's ringing you up, the team, and so on. Yet, as a CEO, you're making 10 times that. You're making £300,000 for probably a tenth of the work. Now, I don't know. There's not, I mean, I'm a simple bloke. There's not a lot of maths in that to say where the best returns are. Mm -hmm. And so your hourly rate as a developer is many many more times more than 10 times that of a project manager and if there's all these other passion projects that help a charity do the, that you want to do well you, you can never do that if you're the project manager mm -hmm. and what you ought to be doing as well as a developer is looking for your next project because the hours you spend looking for your next project will generate you another three hundred thousand. it won't it won't be, you know, it's not about earning that 30, earning that 30,000, you're not leveraging and you can't go and generate that other 300. Now, bring it back to architecture, because I think, I think architects have a passion a lot more than some project managers. And I'm not knocking project managers. They think, I've got a passion for this. You might have. OK, but generally, most people, to be fair, to go into consultancy, don't generally do it for the money because there isn't a huge amount of reward. Mm -hmm. 
I definitely went into it as a business and, and worked it as a business. If you have an absolute passion for architecture and you could genuinely answer that 10 million question and say, I would do some architecture. And I definitely know some architects that would. That's what they would do. Yeah, absolutely. Then do the architecture. But which is the bits of the architecture you like to do? And if it's that high level concept design, finish, stop. Don't start working out the damp proof course and the building regulations in this country requirements. Don't be the technical architect. And, and I'm sure they probably won't. But just do that high level stuff. Or maybe, maybe just do the high level concept. Because my take on it probably is that is the most satisfying bit. You talked about those gap sites in New York. It's, it's a satisfying bit where you go, hey, here's the out of the box thinking. We could create this and do that with a developer's hat on, working with a separate architectural firm. Even if it was your firm that you still owned, mm -hmm. then have one of your other directors take the lead. So you're literally the, the, the developer with a concept. So I'm a developer, and I think out the box. And when I used to develop, I might employ my own structural engineering firm, but I wouldn't be the structural engineer. So the conflict of interest, I think, can be resolved. And as a developer, we need to be out the box thinkers. We need to sweat the asset. So just think of, right, I'm creating the original architecture here as a developer because that's my bent. That's my background, mm -hmm. not because I want to do the architecture. And I think then you could tick both boxes. You could tick that ability to fulfill your passion to do the architecture. You fulfill your ability to deliver what it is you want to do in, in, in housing, wherever you are in the world. And equally, you deliver a highly leveraged business model because you can. Mm -hmm. And you're better than the architect that has to do the project for a fee. Mm -hmm. I love that. That'd be my take on no, that. No, I love, I love that. And I think, that's very, I think that's very interesting. And we've seen similar models, like one of the people we were speaking of yesterday, you know, they're, they're kind of working in the de developments and, and then they might have a separate in-house architecture team that does the, the drawings and the architecture. But then there's people who are delivering those high-level concepts. I've seen it before in the past where we've had architects who – they have their development company and like what you're saying here, they will hire another architecture firm mm -hmm. to actually do the rest of the, the architecture and the, the details and the construction documentation and the CA and all that kind of stuff. And, and that works very well. It's a very kind of, um, it's a, you know, it, as you say, it takes, takes both boxes. I love what you're saying here about the difference between making money and earning money. Now, that's just blown my mind a little bit. And I've heard this principle many, many times, but for whatever reason, it's another level of, of it has kind of clicked. But there is a very distinct difference between the, your exchange of time, for, you know, your hours for a, a set wage versus the making of money, the actual building, out, building an asset, building something which can then be sold, creating value. Could you talk a little bit more about that distinction between making money and earning money and, and how you help people understand that as they're moving into development and the sort of mistakes yeah. that you see people people make particularly from a professional context who are going into becoming developers and are still in the earning money mindset if you like let, let me tell you how that concept came to me many years ago so my uh, my wife my wife of 33 years so we're we're doing well 33 years not congratulations bad, she she must be a saint um she used to work as uh, as a children's nanny, very high level children's nanny for some very, very, very high net worth individuals in the UK. Um, and there was one particular family that she worked for without me saying too much about them. Uh, so they were probably, I was probably, uh, we'd not long been married, we were probably in our 20s, something like that. And they were probably in their 30s, uh, inherited ultimately the family business. Um, Proper old money, okay, proper old money. Uh, you know, they'd had the queen for tea and all that sort of thing. But they, but they had a business behind them. So, 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 so anyway. And uh, the, the guy um, one day came home. I call him John just for the sake of it. And we, I happened to, to they were so, so friendly. And, and I, I was round their house. I was a young trainee structural engineer bit naive in all sorts of ways. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about starting my own business. And um, I don't think I was even qualified then. And I, I was round their house. I mean, this going back then, this was probably a six, seven million pound house. And I think it had 35,000 acres. So you hear it is a fairly sizable chunk of land. In their house, 
uh, waited for my wife. And anyway, John, come home. Call him John. He popped home. Anyway, so uh, I, I was sat waiting. And he said, oh, hi, how are you? He said, do you want a beer? I said, oh, thank you very much. Uh, and he was really friendly. He was so, so super friendly. He was really, And uh, I rather naively said to him, because he'd come back from London, I said, uh, oh, I bet you made a fortune today. It was a bit, you know, it was a bit naive at that age, but I did. I, I did, you know. He had, a, he had a Range Rover and a Porsche and all these, all these trappings that you just looked at as a young lad and thought, oh wow, and the, the big house with the pool and all that sort of stuff, which, you know, later on I got, and um, I often laugh how naive I was. And he said to me, Ryan, he said, no, he said, I, I, I didn't earn any money today. I thought, wow. It's a bad day at the office, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, I'm not doing too bad on my apprentice wage sort of thing. And uh, he said, no, but I made a fortune. <laughs> and it stuck with me. And he never explained it, but I worked out quite what he said quite quickly. And so, so I sometimes tell that story uh, to people. But I think the, the, the thing is you just have to demonstrate it, particularly with industry professionals. It's about, it's about numbers. Calculate your hourly rate. What is your hourly rate? That's all, that's all it comes down to. It's not complicated. So, you know, if you do your own shopping, so my business partner, Ian's written a terrific book called Time Machine, mm -hmm. uh, all about, and it, it breaks this down, your hourly rate. So he said, if you go and do your own shopping, it'd take you a couple of hours to go down to your local supermarket, whatever that might be in this country, your Morrison's, your Waitrose, your Sainsbury's, et cetera, to get that, all that food and take it back. Yet you could probably online order it, or the same food, probably, let's say it takes you half hour, okay? Probably take you less than that. Half hour. So I've now got a, a, a so whatever it's going to take you half hour. So I've now got an hour and a half. And it might cost you five pound to get it delivered, okay? So what you've just worked out is your hour and a half is worth five pound. Even if you say that it takes you an hour to order it, You've just worked out your extra hour to go down and buy it is worth five pound. That's your hourly rate. And you'd be going, no, my hourly rate's a lot more than that. Right. We'll do something different with your hour and pay that delivery driver five pound to get you there. So what's my hourly rate? Sometimes I drive to events. Sometimes I get a driver. Well, if I'm driving to an event and it's four hours, I don't do anything for four hours. I can't do anything apart from make some phone calls. Whereas if I've got a driver who I might pay, 20 pound an hour, and I'm sat in the back, I can work. So, you know, my hourly rate is not 20 pound an hour. So why, why am I not employing a driver? And it comes down to that concept of getting that concept. And that same argument that I said that, that, that I would put to project managers, I always say, okay, how much is, well, first of all, have you got the ability to do the job you're going to suggest? And, and a lot of architects think they want to project manage their own jobs. A lot of structural engineers say the same. No, you're not a project manager. Don't do it. But it does always come down to, and I do a, a deal analysis with them. I get them to do it. We have a deal analysis uh, a, a template that they fill out. And then you identify their professional industry fee. And then I just look at that compared to the profit. As you say, 30,000 or 300. You have a choice. You have a choice. And the numbers do the talking. And, and I, then I just say to people, look, you're better than that. You're now a CEO. I started on the drawing board. I had to make the boss's tea. I had to clean the toilets when I was 16. That was what we did. That was the stuff we had to do. You know, and, and um, you know, why don't, why don't I make the boss's tea anymore? Apart from about not the boss, but why don't I clean the toilets? Because I can get a cleaner to clean the toilets. It's leverage. And, and all we get stuck in or or other potential students might get stuck in is th they don't move forward. So we just have to have all those, these ridiculous things like, well, surely you don't still clean the toilets as you did when you were a junior. Well, of course I don't. Of course I don't. You know? so, so it's, it's that sort of concept. So, so there's the creating a, a, leveraged, a leveraged business as a property CEO. Um, what sorts of challenges do you see with people actually starting their first developments? Procrastination. That's the biggest challenge, okay? Because the biggest challenge is um, 
can I do this? Should I do this? Oh, my word, I'll do it start tomorrow. Well, this is difficult. This, Even for very experienced industry professionals, mm. that procrastination linked with imposter syndrome, okay? Because I, really, is anyone going to take me seriously as a developer? I'm not a developer. And I say, well, hang on a minute. Look, Richard Branson, Richard Branson, when he started his cruise line company, when he went to have that meeting to to engage to someone to build the ship for him or the, the team that were going to market it or whatever, no one sat there and looked at Richard Branson and said, well, hey, hang on a minute. You ever run a cruise line company before? You're not, you're not even got your captain's license. I don't even think you, you've been on a boat. You know, He might not even like boats, but he's a businessman. No one questions him. And that imposter syndrome, so that's their bigger challenge. They've got to get over that. There are some technical ones. I'll talk about those in a minute. But the biggest ones is get over the mindset problems. Mm. Okay, my business partner, Ian, is, is terrific at solving those. And we used to have this, this joke. The first six months, they'd knock on my door for the technical. And the second six months, they'd realize the mindset was even more important to knock on Ian's door. Yeah. So you've got to get over that imposter syndrome. You've got to get over the procrastination. You've just got to start. You know, the, the, great, the great process of one step at a time. Just take that first step, then take the second, take the third. Don't think too much about the fourth or the fifth or the sixth. Mindset. But then beyond that, the problems they get as an entrepreneur, the question I always ask entrepreneurs, Ryan, is are you coachable? Mm -hmm. Are you coachable? And the reality is a lot of entrepreneurs aren't coachable until a few things go wrong, then they realize they are coachable and they should have listened to what we said. It's following the system. I often talk to people, why are costas uh, – you know, McDonald's and those types of businesses successful, not because everyone likes their burgers, you know, or everyone likes their coffee. It's because they have processes and systems developed around those business from years of, of the school of hard knocks from people that's been there, seen it and done it. So I have a system. I have, I said, the eight pillars, you know, credibility and brand is the first pillar, business structure, company structure, business plan, leverage professional team. Uh, finance, you know, deal sourcing, deal analysis, et cetera, et cetera, all these pillars. What people often don't do is follow those processes. Right. They don't follow the process. If you follow the process from beginning to end and do all the things we tell you, then you're more likely to minimize your risk because there is risk involved. You can't deny there's risk. But that's where people will get themselves in trouble. I did a, um, I, I sometimes do it with students. I do often do a lot of wash up meeting. And I have one with some students literally this week, okay, as we're recording it this week. And I said to the, to the two students, tell me what you think you've done wrong. And we had a three-hour meeting. I don't always do this, but the, with them, they made a few mistakes. And they listed out everything they'd done wrong. And I said, well, that's terrific, isn't it? Because you now know what you've done wrong. And primarily, they didn't do some of the things I told them to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's their, their biggest challenge. The, the challenge in terms of getting the, the thing going uh, is finding the deals and understanding deals, and understanding how to analyze deals. That's the biggest challenge. People think the biggest challenge is finding the money or finding the team, but, it, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's actually finding that deal and making it stack up. Well, that, that's... And getting emotion out of it, because, because people get emotional if they're going to earn two to 300,000. You have to strip that out because emotion takes over. Well, Sorry, interrupt. I, I you, thought that please. was what you were, going to, you were going to lead with, actually, was that the, the, most, the biggest challenge is finance, and was, um, was, was quite taken aback that actually the biggest challenge is procrastination just not doing anything at all thinking about it analyzing it which area shall i look at looking to i'm not you know i'm not ready for this or whatever yeah. whatever version of that and 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 i guess as well actually a lot of people will use the excuse of well i don't have the money to be able to do development um but the thing with money let's talk about money okay the thing i always say to money about money to people do we accept the uk right now particularly there's plenty of money out there and most people go, yeah, there is. So I said, the only problem is it's in someone else's bank. Mm -hmm. So you just got to get it into yours. If there was no resource out there, if there was no money out there, and back in 2008, there was some challenging time, then it'd be difficult. So all you need to know is how to get it into your bank. But the bottom line, very, very simply, even where interest rates are where they are now, your uh, capital deposits in a bank might earn 3 or 4%. And as an investor, if you can offer someone 10%, two, three times what they're getting, they're going to be interested to talk. It's a win-win. And the commercial money fundamentally is in the same position. There is more money out there than deals. And here's a mindset shift. The mindset shift that people have to make is the money is subservient to them. They're not subservient to the money. People go in 
subservient. They, their shoulders are down and it's the bowl out in hand. Please, sir, can I have some money? Well, the reality is actually the way around. People with money do not have people knocking on their door every week saying, hey, how can I give you 10% return on your money? The person with the deal, which is you as a developer, if that's what you choose to do, is the one with the opportunity, not the money. It's a whole reverse psychology. And when you get your head around that, you go, well, actually, the money's not a problem. It's the deal that's the problem. And once I've got a deal, I will get the money. Whoa. That's really fast. That's... Whoa. Did that, did that take you back? It did. It really did. You see, look, it let really, me add to really, this concept. It, it, it really did. It really did. Because it's like... Let me add to this concept, okay, for you. Because this will make sense. You do not ask for money. Mm -hmm. Apart from the fact you could fall foul of the uh, FCA, Financial Conduct Authority rules in the UK, don't ask for money. Because let's just say, let's say, Ryan, you rang me up and said, hey, Rich, um, I got an opportunity because it is an opportunity, as I say. Uh, would you lend me 50,000? Now, I'll be thinking, hmm, who else, Ryan, have you asked before you've asked me? And I assume they said no, and that's why you've come to me. And that's the, what people will do. And so the reality is you position yourself. So, Ryan, let's say you're a new developer and we, we rock up and we chat and I go, hey, how are you? I'm seeing you for a, a, a good few months. Yeah, I'm good, Brian says. Yeah, I'm good. I say, what are you up to? You say, well, just doing some development now. I've, I've, I've transitioned, transitioned, okay, into property development. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a real natural progression, for, you know, transition for me being in architecture and that. And I really wanted to help deliver some homes in the UK and, and fulfill that housing gap. And so it's a natural thing. Oh, wow. What sort of things are you doing? And you might say to me, well, I, I've got, um, I've got an old warehouse uh, just down in, in South London. I'm, I'm going to convert to, uh, you know, to seven flats. I've, I've got a, a scheme up in Bristol I'm looking at as well, which was um, uh, it's, it's an old hotel. In fact, we're going to convert that into, into some, um, uh, you know, supported living. For, and it's great. I go, wow, yeah. And, and you're just going to drop into conversation, Ryan. You're going to say to me, and, and yeah, it's, do you know what I like about the model? It's really good because I'm working with some great friends of mine who've invested in the business and they're getting some great returns on their money, which they wouldn't have got in the bank. So it's a real win-win. And, and what a pleasure that is to help other people out. And so, yeah, that's the sort of thing I'm doing. Now, you've just planted a seed. And if I've got some money and if I like you, I might ask you, if I've got no money and I go, oh, wow, that's really interesting, Ryan. Well, hey, look, we must meet again soon. I've got no money or I'm not interested in you. Mm -hmm. If I'm interested, I go, hey, tell me a little bit more about the money thing. That's a buying signal. I'm interested in buying into you, okay? Or, do you know, I might have someone that might be interested. Another buying signal, which might be, I'm interested, but I'm not going to tell you I'm interested, but I, I'm going to portray it as a third party. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, that's, that's the process. You didn't ask for it. All you did is you told me what you did. Do you get that concept? Just very high level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. I love it. I love, I love that kind of total rewiring of, you know, it's not about going and getting money. You're actually creating opportunities. That, that's, that's very powerful. That's, that's making money. Like you've created an idea. You've had an idea. You've created something. You've created an opportunity. You've, you've connected. You've made connections between resources. And then you're presenting it in an in a intelligent manner for other people to see it as an opportunity for them to, to buy into. It's what I say in lots of ways. Okay, this is this stuff is all simple, mm -hmm. but it's not easy. Yeah, but it is simple, isn't it? I mean, I, I mean, the, it takes you back, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people listening to this podcast, and it'll take them back in the same way. Mm -hmm. But actually, this isn't rocket science. I've, this is nothing complicated, and with a bit of guidance and a bit of support, you could do this. Amazing, amazing. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our conversation here we're coming up on the on the hour mark here and it's flown by absolutely fascinating richie really really inspirational kind of mind blowing interesting um and i think a lot of architects developers um will be very you know keen to get in contact with you how what's the best way if people if people listen to this podcast they want to find out more about what you do working with you how do they do that uh, just Google Google my name if you want. Google Richie Clapson. Uh, don't forget the T. You'll find me. Or propertyceo.co.uk, propertyceo.uk, and you'll go to our website. 
uh, obviously on all the platforms, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, etc. Or pop onto YouTube, type in Property CA and go to our YouTube channel. A lot of our podcasts and interviews uh, are on there as well. So lots of different avenues to find. Or just look around the UK. If you're in the UK, I speak all around the country uh, pretty much every month, different venues. So uh, uh, check me out. Come and see me. Come and say hello. Amazing. I'll put all those details into the info of this podcast. Richie, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. And now a message from today's sponsor, RCAT. As design and architecture demand increases, towards pre-pandemic levels and beyond, how are you and your firm keeping up? Well, RCAT's here to help. RCAT.com offers several free tools to help architecture and design firms like yours get work done faster. Use RCAT's powerful search engine to find the right products for your projects and download BIM, CAD, and specifications right there on the same page without having to pay or register. RCAT.com also offers product videos, catalogs, green reports, product certification information, outline and short form specification generation, and more. RCAT.com is your one-stop solution to help increase your productivity and get more projects done. That's RCAT.com, A-R-C-A-T.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.